It's Commerce Great, the visual storytelling show recorded live every other Wednesday at the Ann Arbor District Library, lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan, comics.aadl.org. And this is the show where we talk about how to make comics, uh, what it's like being a cartoonist, uh, the thoughts that go into this medium that drives us all insane. And my name is Jersey Droz, cartoonist and teaching artist. And with me today, we got a big round of Skype guests. I gave producer or technical director Matt Dubay a challenge in uh, roping in multiple Skype guests with multiple video streams. Thank you, Matt Dubay, Einstein85 on the Twitters, for all your hard work on this show. Oh, I uh, really enjoy the challenge. <laughs> that you, you certainly sound like you enjoy the challenge. We're uh, only starting, what, 22 minutes late? <laughs> This happens every time we do the show. Is like something snaps in the Jenga tower and it comes apart just before we get started. Then, but you know what? For the folks who listen to this after the fact, they don't even know. So, well, but, that's the idea, right? But uh, yeah, that is the idea. But I, I do think that it's a good idea for me every once in a while to say to you publicly, "Hey, good job, bro." I do appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> and and Eric Kloster in the chat, EJK on the Twitters, and Tom Smith. I don't know Tom's Twitter handle. I don't know if he's even on Twitter. No, he's one of the one of the ones who's not on it. Okay, he's one of the good ones. All right, but but Thank then you. we got to turn to our guests today because we got a really exciting man. Th there are so many layers to what I want to talk about today, guys. I, there's no way we're going to fit this in an hour. Uh, we got Brandon Perlow of NewParadigmStudios.com. Hi, Brandon. Hi. And uh, and then we've got uh, just audio only. We've got Paul Mendoza, who also works for New Paradigm Studios. Hello there. And, uh, Paul, I hope you're feeling better soon. Uh, Paul is suffering from uh, some kind of bug, so hopefully it won't interfere <laughs> with, the, with the, discu the discussion today. Um, and then, last but not least, definitely not least, because this guy gets talked about a lot in all the different audio pr and video productions I've done in the past, is Rick Leonardi, uh, man who needs zero introduction. Uh, un well, go, but go ahead and try anyway. <laughs> Rick Leonardi, uh, man, okay, so, you know, one of the big ones that you're known for is Cloak and Dagger, um, but, man, you've done, you've had your, your hand on just about every Marvel character. Uh, nobody draws Spider-Man the way you draw Spider-Man, and I mean, and if I had my way, uh, if, if you were interested, uh, you would be the only artist for Spider-Man because your characters are, you know, some of the most graceful uh, gracefully drawn and gracefully moving characters on the page. Oh, I, people have heard thanks. Me. Thanks. Your lips to Joe Casada's ears. <laughs> <laughs> no, ser seriously. I mean, there, there's a, there was one issue of Cloak and Dagger where uh, Spider-Man shows up and he he literally dances with Dagger in the episode. And there's that scene where he, she lifts his mask and, uh, but just just the the grace of that scene is just it it really uh, I was gripped by it. I had a, an aesthetic arrest uh, when I was reading your work. So, uh, and well, I'm sure. Thanks. Thanks. I mean, uh, Dagger, you know, it's part of, it's a functional part of her biography that she was a ballet dancer student. So we, I actually had to do quite a bit of background reference on classical ballet technique to get her, get her posture correct and her movement. So I'm glad it paid off. I'm glad you were paying attention. <laughs> well, yeah. But anyway, we're going to talk about that in the in the new book that you're working on now. The second issue just came out. So New Paradigm Studios. Uh, quick introduction, and then we're going to talk about a lot of things that uh, are, are come to mind as we as we think about this project. Um, new New Comics uh, Company Studio, right? Uh, Brandon, I'm wondering if you can tell us about. I mean, what do you got? You got uh, three books out now, right? No, uh, two, two, two comics of uh, Watson and Holmes are out. Uh, second title will be out next month, and the third title will be out probably in January. Okay, and 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 you guys are on Comics Plus, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and then mm -hmm. you, you also print books that you take to shows. Yep. Um, some interesting publishing model stuff going on there. But before we dive into that, I want I want to peel at the first layer of this. So, Brandon, you come to this comics business by way of Hollywood in the sense that you are a visual effects artist. Is that correct? That's correct. So you worked for Jim Henson's Creature Shop. You did visual effects on X-Men, uh, National Treasure. So I'm curious. This is the first thing I want to ask is as, as you coming into this thing, um, is there any way that being a visual effects artist first in coming into it at comics do you think is there any way that that colors or changes the way you approach it like how is your approach affected by that if at all i think only on my book <coughs> nimbus where i'm doing digital artwork with it i think everything else i'm just trying to approach it as 
you know, the books is good comic book storytelling. Um, comics have always been my love first. Visual effects have just been a field that, you know, that, you know, supported me quite well. And, you know, it's been challenging, but it's not my first love. Well, what, one of the things that I'm thinking of is something Keith Giffen said years ago. And Keith Giffen is, you know, he's well known for his uh, uh, very opinionated stances on things. And he, <laughs> and he said, uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing now because I don't want him to come after me, but he said something along the lines of one of the problems with comics is that everybody who's working in comics uh, has only read comics. So mm -hmm. I'm just curious, you know, and I mean, you're saying you had a li lifelong love of comics. I'm just curious of working in another creative field where you're doing a different kind of visual storytelling. I'm wondering if, like, you if you notice anything different uh, when you're working on this <laughs> stuff. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I think I'm always looking at how things work all the time. I mean, that's always going in the back of my mind because it's like we're always having to, like, make things look real and visual effects and believable. So that always clouds me a lot of times when... Um, you know, looking at stuff. So I'm always having that going on. Um, but other than that, I, I try and look at other influences besides comics, um, you know, just other TV shows, you know, other books. Um, but yeah, I mean, really all that the effects business really does is really, you know, push um, your sense of reference and your sense of like observation. It really, that it's it just taken to another degree. Okay, so um, I didn't really know this about Brandon that he had uh, that he had a uh, movie background, and in a way, in a way that's 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 part of a very long tradition. You, you, you know, they they tell stories of the original guys who invented the the comic book vocabulary back in the back in the '30s and the '40s. A lot of them learned their craft essentially by sitting in movie theaters and watching. The movies of the time over and over and over again. And people talk about watching Citizen Kane 30 or 40 times mm -hmm. in a row. Wow. Um, you know, to absorb the shot structure and the sequencing and the camera movement and all that kind of stuff and finding analogs to bring into comic books. So Brandon's Brandon's just just the latest generation of guys who were you know, cross pollinating and making us all better for it. Well, I mean, you yourself, Rick, you were saying earlier about you know doing reference for dancing, and I'm sure that when you are in a creative field, I mean, this is the thing that you know I I, I teach some comics work uh, workshops mm -hmm. and classes. And, and, I, and I'm telling my students is that you always have to keep that analytic eye open is whenever something grips you and moves you, you have to stop and ask, why did that happen? Uh, what did that person do to make me feel that feeling? Because that you're adding tools to your utility belt uh, of being at the page, right? So even plays, like learning blocking by watching how the, the plays are staged up and blocked out. Um, Everything can be a source of uh, of learning for visual storytelling, right? But I'm I'm I, but I'm also glad to, to not hear the whole like, well, I wanted to make a comic that felt like a film. Uh, comics has its own unique magic to it, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, I'm getting I'm getting back to Keith Giffen's uh, Keith Giffen's quote to you. I mean, I, I think what he's saying, and and this is true, that you know, comic books is is a sequential thing. You know, it relies. A lot on fan enthusiasm, so it's entirely it's it's way too easy, frankly, to get kind of derivative. I mean, people do the same panels over and over and over again, and they forget they forget what the original reason was for that panel and why you employ that panel in that spot at that time. Um, you no, know, it, it, it's useful to step back from the industry, step back from the medium, go to another medium to kind of refresh your memory about you know okay. Why am I using establishing shots, or what are establishing shots good for? What are establishing shots even? You know, sometimes you have to kind of get out of comic books to to reeducate yourself. Uh, I think that's <laughs> that is a terrific point. Now, yeah, I, I do think that's probably where Keith was going with that statement. Uh, no. So, talking about derivations, let's talk about Watson and Holmes a little bit, shall we? Uh, and an interesting thing about this book. Is um, I, I put out a call on Twitter just this morning uh, to say like, hey, everybody who listens to the show, if you could do one public domain character, uh, what would it what, what would it be and how would you change it? And one of the responses that I got was uh, re 
remember, everyone, no fair choosing Sherlock Holmes unless you make an, an Egyptian wizard because that's the only thing not done yet. And yes, Sherlock Holmes has been covered a lot. Oh, and by the way, as a parenthetical statement, everybody, I know that the, the actual status of uh, Sherlock Holmes being a public domain character is there's like a little bit of a dispute about that. We could put a link in the show notes to a Tech Dirt article on this point. Uh, somebody representing the uh, Conan Doyle estate uh, is contesting whether or not it actually is in the public domain. But this is where I want to go with it, it actually. is like So you guys reimagined Sherlock Holmes, and you yourself even said in other interviews that he, he's a very popular character. You know, there's, there's been the movies with Robert Downey Jr., there's that new BBC show, there's lots and lots of different uh, iterations and derivations on this idea. Um, is that not a case for why the public domain is so important? Because something from so long ago can be breathe life in all sorts of new ways and, and create new versions that are completely, uh, you know, for this generation. Like, for instance, your version of Sherlock Holmes is lives in New York. He's not a Brit British guy, and he's African-American, you know? And, uh, you know, there, there's, there's uh, different things that trickle down in the story as a result of those two initial choices. But I, I'm just wondering, it was, was it... Uh, uh, was it an intentional thing to go for the public domain, or was it just like an intuitive thing, like, oh, you know, it'd be cool? It was pretty much uh, Paul and I, uh, you know, around New Year's, we were talking about, like, why hasn't this been done? And, you know, <laughs> the more we thought about it and coming up with ideas, uh, we just decided, let's go for it and let's try and, you know, see how far it goes. There was something very natural about the concept, actually, when you think about Holmes' connection to the streets and the fact that he's not a detective that goes to, like, well, technically, it depends on what story. Uh, he's not a detective that works for the high and mighty or the most powerful people, but a lot of his cases involve people on the streets, and we figured that it might be, why not take that concept and have Holmes more streetwise, more, more modern, and... In a world that is, in a world where they've not had a Sherlock Holmes sort of, you know, character involved in. I mean, really, this is just something we're just like, wait, why hasn't somebody done this? This would be, this would be a really interesting way of telling the stories. I'm curious, Paul. That was an interesting thing that you said there. That I want to grab onto and jump off of, and I'm hoping all you guys can respond to this since you're all the creative team on this. Um, you talked about. He's uh, Holmes is like as a guy of the streets kind of idea. So, do you think when c approaching an intellectual property uh, that that is available to use like that, like one of my dreams in life is to actually do a graphic novel version of Pippi Longstocking, but I, I don't know what I would do with it. I don't. I I haven't really thought about it hard. It's just I love the book since I was a kid, and I just I would love to draw her doing all those amazing things. Um, but something you said there, Paul, I think is really interesting is kind of getting to what makes the character work. You know, um, it's like it's like going back to Spider-Man, Peter Parker, as long as you have him uh, hurting for money, <clears throat> having a bad social life. Aunt May is sick and he's got to fight a guy. You've got a good Spider-Man story, right? There's like a, an essence to what makes the character tick. Right. Great power, great responsibility and all that. Do you think yeah, that, that yeah. do you think that that's important? Uh, and and if, if so, how do you get to that by what, what's your investigation process? Or is this something where it's kind of like just talking with buddies and it's off the cuff? I wonder who wants to jump in on that one. I think we, Paul and I, initially we were talking about what we liked about Sherlock Holmes and what we felt didn't work in Sherlock Holmes in today's times, like what would need to be redone uh, or at least altered a bit to make it more current and actually fit with what we're doing with the changes. There was just something also about the fact that the, there were overlooked characters in the stories too. Um, Lestrade was always kind of just... I don't know if the, Rick. I don't know if the right word's like a foil. He was just never really used much in in a way that I think could have been helpful to the stories. And I think that the character of uh, um, Eileen Adler, I think they've kind of done. I, I actually, to be totally honest, I haven't seen enough of the new Sherlock series, but I know that she's in it. But we have concepts for her as well. There are characters in these stories that I think really kind of transfer over well to modern times. I mean, you look at Watson and his connection to the British war in Afghanistan in his time period and the modern, the modern wars that, we, that we now have in Afghanistan. It's so many things here, um, just come over nicely can be retold 
translated different it's just slightly but it's still what's interesting about it is it really keep, the story still keeps its essence is sherlock holmes is still somebody who lives above a bookstore or in this case an r&b store and it's so many elements can just be brought over and i now realize i haven't i don't know if that is exactly what you were asking well, <laughs> but uh well i wonder if, we, if rick can weigh in on this well yeah yeah i, I think i think please please rick the answer comes in the answer comes in two two parts. I mean, the first part is that Sherlock Holmes is, if you if, and the boys have heard me say this before, but I mean, if you really took a survey of successful literary franchises in the English canon, the English language, I mean, it, it would be hard really to find a character that supported more interpretations, more riffs, more various mediums. Uh, media than than Sherlock Holmes. Um, yeah, prob probably the most successful f literary franchise there is, and it, it's not because Conan Doyle, Conan Doyle is some sort of amazing writer. It's because he happened to stumble on something really, really essential that people respond to, you know, across cultures and across times. Um, and it, 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 it has to do, I think, probably with the puzzle solving, the idea that that by just by paying attention to life, you can make sense of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know that that kind of thing, and the you know, solving yeah. crimes and writing wrongs doesn't doesn't hurt either. That said, uh, I think what what Brandon and Paul and have, have the, the genius of this is that th their character has the opportunity here to do to to break new ground. I mean, if there's a limitation to the original Holmes, it's the Englishness, it's the rootedness in the Victorian era. The fact that Holmes, yep. the, the the Irene Adler is that that kind of that cramped, not quite romantic thing. I mean, that's that's a that's a function of Doyle's time and his discomfort with that whole theme. I mean, we could we could go places with that that Doyle never dreamed. At the same time, I mean, Paul was talking about, or Brandon was talking about Lestrade. Uh, Lestrade is a foil. He, he's he needs to be kind of kind of clumsy and two steps behind Holmes, and that again is an artifact of Doyle's approach. That's not going to work in the present day. Our cops are way better than that, which means that our Holmes is walking a much finer line than the original Holmes did. Our Holmes, our Holmes has to be he has to be better than the bad guys, but he has to be he has to work very delicately with the cops. It's a much tighter seam, and he's 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 his status. The original Holmes, you, you, you got you got the sense that that right or wrong, solve the case or not, he he had a comfortable life. No one was really going to bother them bother him in two twenty one Baker Street. He wasn't going to get sued. He wasn't going to get arrested. The cops weren't going to shut him down. Our guy, not so much. Our guy could easily you know step wrong and get into some serious trouble. Either way, bad guys or cops. As yeah. in this uh, story too, there's there's a respect that he has for Lestrade, right? And no, and it appears in the story like stuff we were talking about last night that he has to pretty much respect her jurisdiction and try to work with her as best as possible. He can't afford to lose her as an ally, right? No, I think it's uh, I I think those two axes at least uh, present us opportunities. To, to add to the Sherlock Holmes canon in, in ways that, that nobody really else, nobody else really has the chance to do. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that's what, what you guys are all talking about, too, is I, I think this is an interesting case for uh, public domain. You know, this is something that goes round and round where public domain or, or copyright laws keep getting extended to being longer and longer and longer as vested interests fight for to, to hang on to their beloved properties. But there's there's an enriching that happens when a, a, a property goes into the public domain and you get to do things like what you guys are talking about. And I think it challenges, I mean, the, the, the fear is that a bunch of cheapskates are gonna come in and just try to make a bunch of uh, cheap garbage property just to like cash in on something that's popular. But uh, I think that the, the that's just noise where uh, something where somebody carefully thinks about what makes the in initial idea work, what makes it tick, that's what's going to rise up. And that BBC Sherlock show is pretty popular. And I've seen a few episodes that's pretty good. 
right? Uh, I, I myself was, when I first heard about that show, I was like, what, modern day, whatever. And then as soon as I watched it, I was like, oh, oh, I see. It, it, it can work and even go into interesting places like what you guys are doing uh, with, with your book. So um, real quick, I want to hit on some of these other points here. So uh, you guys are doing an interesting publication strategy. Uh, I'm sure you guys all saw, it was passed around a lot yesterday, uh, that Jim Zub article. Yeah, saw that. Uh, that's at jimzub.com. And, uh, yeah, yeah. So he, he posted basically how, <laughs> what a deadly business this independent comics publishing in the direct market can be. And, you know, uh, dispelling the myth that we're all getting tons and tons of money off of this. And, and I love that. I love the whole aspect of being a cartoonist is I've got half of the people I meet go, oh, that I sounds never like. Heard, I never heard this myth. You never heard this? <laughs> I, 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 I Charles Schultz. Well, you you have like a couple of people like Charles Schultz and Jim Davis who like really you know make a real good go of it, and then you got some people who think that that's what every cartoonist is doing, right? And then you got the other half who thinks that we're just a bunch of children who don't have real jobs. Uh, but that, there's well, nothing. Those would be the, those would be the wives. <laughs> <laughs> and to, to which, to which I, I proudly refute by saying, well, yes, yeah, it is great. We do get to remain children forever. Uh, that's not a bad way to make a living. Uh, but, but anyway, you know, one of the things that uh, Jim Zub did is, uh, is uh, he basically pointed out like how the economics break down when you're doing independent comics publishing and pointed out that you know, you're kind of operating at a loss most of the time if you're doing monthly independent uh, magazine-style books. So what you guys are doing is actually pretty interesting to me because what you're doing is you're going digital first, printing them as you need them for shows, right, and then possibly collecting as a graphic novel or seeking a p publisher. Um, you know, is 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 that the plan? Is to keep your options open while the the thing is being produced and using digital as your monthly absolutely. magazine? Absolutely. Yep. I'm wondering. Um, if you could speak I'm also to taking a look at getting into you know figuring out how we can get the books into overseas in the French market because. The French comic book market's far bigger than the American one in terms of like um, readership, and um, I'd, I'd like to get a, a you know a translated copy of the books very soon, um, and just see if we can get them you know as, again first digitally as well because I know that Comicsology and Comics Plus uh, have French editions of their books, as well as other um, you know d digital distributors. Okay. So yeah, actually, that is that is an interesting thing to think about is uh, those markets simultaneously, uh, what, in, instead of just focusing on North America diamond distribution, right? Uh, because that is so economically difficult for, uh, especially if you're not a, um, a superhero book too, right? Or like, a, well, I, I I think like Watson Holmes has like a, a a niche niche enough thing like like The Walking Dead where it's a very specific and popular genre slash intellectual property right but you know if, if you're doing anything outside of either like a really really popular niche or um superhero stuff it's pretty tough in that market right um think, go ahead i think some of it has to do with um a lot of the major comic book press sites uh they focus purely on marvel and dc and a few image books and it's very hard to get them to like give you press I mean, it's it's really, you know, if they don't really say, hey, this is an awesome book, no one's going to know that you're an awesome book and pick you up. <laughs> that That is part of the puzzle, isn't it? Is it? This is the whole chicken and egg thing. It's like, yeah, well, what, exactly. what, what do retailers want to hear about? Uh, what do the fans want to <laughs> hear about? And, you know, you, you get these little breakthrough things where it's like, hey, support independent publishers and give them a chance. Uh, well, how about you rephrase that to say, no, this book is just awesome and you should just want it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that is a, a, a big issue. Um, so one of the other things you're doing on Comics Plus that I think is kind of cool, and this is something I've talked about myself in, in other shows, is um, you're, doing, you're getting double duty out of the, the work by releasing a black and white version and a color version digitally. And the black and white version is a little cheaper uh, than the color version. <laughs> Actually, they're version. the same price. Are they? Are they the same both price? Ni both 99 cents. Uh, oh. We just, we just released you know, the black and white one for people who just want to see Rick Lee and Artie's art <laughs> in the raw. Basically, just Rick's art with the lettering. That's it. All and, five of them. 
<laughs> no, this is actually pretty. This is a cool idea, and this is something where I'm wondering if the, if the art style that you chose, Rick, was uh, partially because of this, or was it just an a after the fact? You're like, you know what, this art looks really good on its own. Uh, n nothing, nothing against Paul. There, uh, the colors are gorgeous on it, but there is something kind of nice about being able to have the choice of seeing that really soft pencil art that you did, Rick. Yeah. Well, it, what, what's interesting about it is it's my thinking about it has evolved. I thought, you know, at, in the beginning, I thought, oh, my God, what am I going to do without an anchor? And my so my my first impulse was to try and make dark, crisp pencils that would scan and and basically stand in for for the inks themselves which is a kind of an artificial way of thinking after I've, I've, I've since come around to the view that oh, screw it just draw it just draw it and it's going to be its own it's going to be its own sort of black plate it's a, a black plate that wouldn't work you know if I were to hand it over to an inker but at the same time, it's a black plate that no one's seen before kind of thing. Or I, I think we are actually kind of creating a, a, not a new medium, but a, but a you know, sort of a, you know, a medium subprime or something, some sort of, you know, subset of pencils here. Well, so it, it's interesting. It's, a, it's been an interesting experience. And, and from the technical standpoint, it's been an education. Well, you, do you, you guys remember Epic Illustrated, that magazine yeah. that Marvel did back in the, what was it, the yep. late 70s, early 80s? Yeah, sure and, do. And, and it had that deluxe printing on it, so you could have, you know, like, just soft pencil comics because it wasn't being printed on newsprint. It, I don't know if it was that Baxter paper or what, but it was it was a nicer printing. And, and that technology is a lot more available now, so you get to do this, right? That that whole inking thing was a limitation of the, the, the technology at the time. Uh, although that, that does make inking even more of an art form now because we don't need to do it. So, yeah, we have more visual options. But I just, one of the things that, uh, and this is where I want to do like a little promo for the book for everybody uh, who's listening or watching. Uh, you got to check these pages out because Rick's stuff is always graceful, first of all. But it takes on this whole new kinetic kind of feel with these scribbly shadows and all of these sketchy lines. Everything's now, it's like, it's vibrating with life, uh, with, still with those graceful forms. That was the my first re uh, reaction when I opened the, or flipped open the book on my tablet was, I was like, oh, he's not inking. And then I looked at it again and went, oh, you know, it's like, I haven't seen his stuff look this energetic since Spidey 2099. Well, yeah, um, you know, I, I, I'm afraid that a lot of what you're seeing is that the, the lines I hadn't quite erased. <laughs> but, but yeah, I, you know, from actually from the, from from that standpoint, it it, it 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 it's an educational tool, kids. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I've I've heard tell that there are pencilers who can start at the 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 upper left corner of a page and work their way to the lower right and never make a mistake. But I'm definitely not one of them. If you want to see if you want to see real trench warfare on a page, come buy this book. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's the tagline uh, for the ad for the book, um, and 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 Paul, I swear to God, we're going to get to talking about the coloring on this thing. But real quick, since we're on the topic of the, you know the fluidity and and vitality of of your forms, uh, you know, you hinted before we started recording that you've got a treatise or uh, something uh, like a piece that you harangue people with in terms of. Uh, capturing fluidity on the page. I know this is something my students struggle with all the time. Is how do you find the moment that is a static moment that feels like it's moving, right? And I haven't found the words to do. I'm like, well, you know, it's the spine, it's the through line, everything like that. But it's like, how do you, how do you break it down, Rick? Um, well, I think actually the point I was I was making. I mean, it's the, in the case of Dagger, which is the, the 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 character I always use when I when I do this little riff. Um, it, it is the through line, but um, I go back again to that to the reference work I did with classical ballet and classical classical ballet, uh, at least from the point of view of the ballerina. It's the sternum. The sternum always leads first. So if you look at Dagger, she's generally leading with her chest the whole time, um, and that's straight out of classical ballet. And it's it's absolutely integral to the way she moves. Um, so that in essence, she's uh, you have to pair her up with that with the uh, cloak, of course, and what you wind up with is with is 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 this great duality. 
you know, she's her concavity or her convexity is 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 mirrored by his, you know, his concavity, mm. his tallness by her smallness, his darkness to her lightness, that kind of thing. So that um, these are all the ways these are there are there are a whole catalog between the two of them. There's this enormous catalog of ways of characterization that have nothing to do with their with their specific biographies or their names or their, even how they their faces. Um, or how they sound. Um, there's all these visual ways of distinguishing one character from the other um, and characterizing them. And the, the two of them, uh, like I say, I mean, the, the two of them are the basis for this little lecture that I give when, when people get me going. Are you, are, so you're thinking about this when you're doing uh, Watson and Holmes, too, I'll bet. Like, wh how can I express the character through the gesture? Is that what you're right. saying? Right. I mean, you know, I haven't really... I haven't really evolved it that to that extent, but again, I mean, Holmes Holmes is 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 a slighter guy, kind of. I think we've established him as a kind of a neat Nick. He's a little, you know, he's a little particular about things. He's he's kind of he's he's more of a more of a spidery guy. The guy I actually use for a model uh, works at my daughter's school as a, as a security guard, and he's got that kind of lanky kind of almost double jointed feel to him and and so that's him and in contrast what you got in Watson of course is is this big you know linebacker type of character um, <clears throat> and and that's you got to stick with that and you got to carry that through and that's that's one way of signaling you know characterization one way of defining each character to the reader, establishing them, establishing their their identities to the reader without you know without hanging a tag on them or having them speak or anything like that. Right. But, this this is this is Watson. He's grumpy. <laughs> With yeah. the, the caption box, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, but when, yeah, one of the things that I noticed in the book is there's a shot of watching Watson walk. We were behind him, you know, looking at him from behind, and he has this you. you rendered him as like with this nice uh boldish contour to emphasize like the the roundness of his upper body and then the, the leg is bowed in just such a way to almost look like it's doing this cartoon sag as he's coming <laughs> down on it um uh, it, it, it's really neat how you can straddle that line between pure cartoon and representation in your work and yeah it, it's it's there if, if you look for it that that kind of heaviness to his form versus holmes's lankiness so uh, yeah well, I mean, it, it speaks to, I think, one of the points that you, you probably cover in, in your teaching is, is all the ways, all the ways you know as a cartoonist that you're doing your job the way, the way it ought to be done. And, and part, of, part of the cartoonist's job is, is characterization. And it's not just, you know, getting the insignia right on the uniform. It's, you know, it's how the guy in the uniform moves. And that's you know it's just barely scratching the surface. It's a big topic. Let me tell can, you. Can 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 I uh, twist your arm into coming back for a full hour just <laughs> on that topic because I'm I'm dying to, to, to that's this is one of my favorite subjects uh, in comics is that sense of dynamism and not not just Kirby dynamism where it's like it's like a scream, uh, but but also like the you know the kind of graceful dynamism that you see in your work. So. Um, Anyway, yeah, we, we, we uh, our librarian Sharon Iverson is is about ready to come in for our book talk segment. Uh, so we got to we got to close pretty soon here. But I want to give time to talk to Paul because this is an interesting thing. Paul's credit on the book. He's not the colorist. He's the color artist. Was that a deliberate choice? Uh, you know, I don't know. That's a just That's an question. <laughs> that is a justing question. There, there's an implication in that 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 word choosing there, and I like it uh, because well, color the colorist is a lot different than the days when we used to cut ruby lith uh, back in the old days. Oh, uh, Doctor Martin thinks I remember you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm wondering, yeah. if, you know, like just I'm just curious, uh, you know, what 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 tools do you use? Are you a Photoshop guy? Uh, right now, it is Photoshop. Yeah, okay. and. It's kind of interesting. It's still an ongoing process. You'll notice some uh, differences as you go through issues one and two, and that's because the whole thing is evolving as we're doing this. It's like, you know, I think I like how this looks better. I like how this looks better. You know, I would I would say that it really is something that it is also, like everything else in this book, it's turned out to be a real group process. 
we, you know, we're taking everybody's advice in. And there's, I don't know if it's really even mentioned, but Rick has been very integral to the story, for instance, uh, mm-hmm. being the Sherlock, the, whole, the Sherlock fan that he is. It's interesting. Everybody's had a say on various parts of the book. And right now, we're moving all the pages to, I guess you could say, towards a more uh, vivid color scheme as opposed to some of the more really watercolory, washed out sort of, um, almost like, you know, paint. Eh, I don't know, how would you call that, Brandon, the first issue? The extremely watercolory sort of look? Yeah, I, I would say it's very uh, subdued. Subdued. Um, it's one of those things where as we're looking at everything as a whole, I mean, we are a new company and just trying to figure these things out. Now that we're seeing what the second issue looks like, we're getting an idea now as to how we really want this whole project to look. So and that's one of the great things about digital is that you can go back and modify things to your heart's content. It's also a bad thing, mind you, but, <laughs> um, right now what's happening is that we're able to fine tune things well enough to where once we do put out a trade paperback of this, it's really going to be pretty neat looking. Um, right now, I think my favorite is, though, the, um, the noir edition, because this is one of the first times I think can remember where I've actually gotten to see Rick Leonardi's like pencils. Everything mm-hmm. has been inked over. Mm-hmm. And you lose, and it's not to dis inkers, because the inker brings their own, you know, interpretation of things to the artwork. Absolutely. It is just yeah. so nice. Yeah, it's so nice to see some of these pencils in this form because you realize how much disappears, how much was there, what the intent was comes through a lot clearer. And even though our colors are becoming more vivid, we're trying to think of something that's going to be um, more complementary to his pencils. Well, I can't, I can't let uh, a compliment like that pass without paying it back. I mean, Paul's, Paul's colors, um, whether, whether he's using a desaturated palette or whether he's bringing it up a little bit, a little bit brighter, as you'll see in, the, in, in issue two, um, he's getting incredible depth, um, depth, depth uh, like I've never seen in a comic book. And, and panel by panel, there's, there's such great depth of field that... Um, one of the one of the one of the complaints I always have about comic books is how how the reader's eye just skips right right to a comic book. I mean, you can digest a comic book in five minutes unless something stops you, unless something grabs you and holds you. And I, I, Paul's color is doing that to me anyway. It's making me really study the each panel as I go along. So is, that's a good thing. Is this just about uh, making the book look good, or is there a storytelling element in you guys' discussions? When oh, you're God. It's, it's, oh God! Oh God! Yeah. It's an introduction. Oh, yeah. it, no, in Paul's case, it's, it's an introduction of air and space to every panel. Every panel, the panels don't lie there as two-dimensional squares. They're actually little cubes. There's like a little atmosphere in there that's worth examining, and, and that's all to do with Paul and the color. So I'm curious, Paul. I mean, what 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 are you thinking about? Like, because uh, when even in the first issue, there's some different color themes going on there's cooler scenes there's warmer scenes in the book and i'm wondering like if you could explain like just a few of the things that are do you have like a a a mental sort of checklist of okay here's the things that i'm going to if i don't know where to go with the color on this here's my go-to list of what to think about uh generally the mood of the scene what's going on you going with cooler more subdued colors when for instance during the first issue when watson is in the hospital it's a generally a pretty grim sequence all the way through with both the patients coming in. So washing everything out, bringing things down to a very cold feeling was the uh, what we were trying to go for here. Um, you make everybody you make everybody feel something with the colors you choose. And it really I think that's what we were going for. You try to think of, you know, when things are possibly moving towards a little more hope or a little more mystery, moved it to a little um, warmer tones when he was outside. Right. You know, and yeah, so there is something to that. Right. So it's back to your original point. I mean, it, story storytelling is what we're about, and what Paul's describing is a process of, of using color to tell the story. So, indeed, he is a color artist and not merely a colorist. So, We have solved it. We've well, cracked the you. nut. 
So yes, color artist is is now the term uh, I think that we should use. Uh, and also, when you're talking about people like John Workman, letter artist, right, or or sound artist, I would call them. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. So so yeah, we've we've been we've been saddled with a lot of bad nomenclature over the years. <laughs> Uh, first the word comics, and then all of the names of the jobs within. Uh, penciler. Yeah, that just means you're just putting drawings on a pencil, right? Uh, okay, well, um, we're going to get to book recommendations. Sharon's here. Sharon Iverson is in the building. Uh, uh, but real quick. Hi, I, I, Sharon. Hi there. <laughs> I don't know Hello. if you guys could see her uh, from that viewing angle, but but she is here. And we're going we're gonna to do some book talks. We're going to do some, uh, we always close the show with some book recommendations of, okay, well, we got you excited about this medium. What should you read next besides Watson and Holmes? So we're going to talk about where they can get that. Uh, I, I just want to say one more thing that, uh, that, Brandon, you said in an interview recently that I thought was really, really interesting. Um, you said Craig Thompson is redefining the medium of comics. You spoke very excitedly about Habibi. Uh, have yeah. you read that yet, I was going to recommend that, actually. Yeah, that is quite possibly the best book I've read, read in the past five years or so. It's and, outstanding. And you, meant, you mentioned Tale of Sand, too, which I recently finished. And that book is really good. And talk about color use, right? Color oh, it's be- incredible. Yeah. But I think Habibi's just, like, on such another level. I mean, it's like it really takes comic book narrative to the highest point I've seen it in years. Wow. Wow. That is, so uh, I, I, this is this is uh, another thing that I think is really cool is that often when you hear interviews with people who are in comics, uh, you know, they're like, what are you reading right now? I'm like, oh, Batman. I think uh, well, you know, anything Grant Morrison does. And it's cool to hear people talking about like dipping from such a wide variety of, of stuff. One of the arguments I get into with my friends, a friendly argument, is, is that d- debating whether or not it's all just comics or whether it has provinces. And to some people, there are some very, very clear provinces with a clear border. And you don't look outside. You don't look across that border, right? Uh, but then to, there's other people, and this is what I was picking up from your statement, Brandon, is that there's some, some people who are like, is it sequential narrative? I'll read it. Give it to me, right? Uh, is, is, as long as it's good. So anyway, uh, so what is it? Just real quick, if you could sum it up in one point, what is Craig Thompson doing that's so different than what everybody else is doing? I think he made like a very epic story, and he put many different layers in the storytelling of that uh, story. It's a it's about three hundred pages or so. So I mean, it's it's huge. Um, there's a beautiful movement to the um, to the art, especially with his ink. Um, I mean, I can't really put it to words, <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> it, it, it's massive, and I think it's even better than blankets. Wow. Better than Goodbye Chunky Rice? That's that's my favorite so far of his of his work. No, I haven't read that to be honest. Um, I, I've been reading lots of other stuff lately. I mean, I'm, I mean, of course, I read you know the big two stuff and some image stuff. You know, Love Saga. You know, I just picked up a book called Northlanders. I didn't read it when it came out, but I, I ordered a whole bunch of other ones just to you know keep reading it because it's a great book. Well, see that that's a perfect segue into talking book mm-hmm. talks. Uh, so, so one one last time, Watson and Holmes can be found at newparadigmstudios.com. It's on Comics Plus. That's and, right. And we're gonna when we before we end the show, we'll talk about any appearances that you guys are doing. Although convention season is winding down as we're heading towards the holidays, but we'll talk about other places where they can find it. So, Sharon Iverson of the Ann Arbor District Library, comics.adl.org. Hey, Sharon. Hey. Good to see you. How are you doing? Good. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I see that you have a pile of books, a small and stack, a, a, a short stack of books to yep. talk about. So, what do you got, uh, I'll, uh, Brandon and Paul and uh, Rick? If you guys want to think up any books that you want to talk up in a second, feel free. But you sure. don't have to. You know, I, I didn't. I don't think I warned you guys about this. So, no we'll let Sharon start while you guys think <laughs> of uh, what you want to recommend. What do you got, Sharon? Well, um, I didn't exactly plan this, but it ends up that I had a little pile of books over time piled up. Um, that have something to do with the water. Um, oh. I want to. I, I kind of call them my salty dogs, but some are set <laughs> in fresh water, so that's not quite true. So, of course, number one. Oh gosh, is yes. Captain Cat. You had to bring Captain Cat yes. into this. Yes, and you know it's sort of. Oh, uh, so yeah. Let's get it on camera. Here we go. Okay. Okay. So yeah, you guys uh, on Skype are not going to be able to see this, but the fo- after the fact, you can be able to see this, and the folks watching on the live stream can see this. So yes, Captain Cat, uh, former shark hunter, which I did uh, with my wife Anne. So you know, Captain Ahab. <laughs> yeah. Kind of a uh, you know not not Watson and Holmes <laughs> derivation, but you know anyway, it's a it's a fun story about. Um, 
a captain who is given up shark hunting but finds that the sharks will not leave him alone. <laughs> and my favorite uh, scene is showing all three of the main characters, Captain Lau and... Um, Oh, Lady Sophie? Who's oh, yeah, Lady Sophie. Who's constantly barfing because yeah, she she's sees not, it. she doesn't have sea legs. And then... Oh, uh, oh yeah, that, that's ship's cook Maggie. Maggie, who is envisioning as the shark is jumping to uh, take Captain Lau um, of what dishes she could make out of... Um, yeah, the she, she has yes. a fascination with bully beef. Food, yes, yes food. So, well, and, yeah, and, and what I like about this is that it's it's truly a salty tale complete with a glossary in the back for those people who maybe are landlocked uh, like myself and that the uh, terms that you use are actually historically accurate. Right? Well, we went to our local library oh, well, and we okay. got a book called Sea Language Goes Ashore to get reference on this. <laughs> and yes, we used a lot of uh, I- idioms from sailor talk like uh, bully beef. Uh, mm-hmm. I forget some of the other ones. Stow your gaff. Yes. Uh, and, and as we were writing the book, Anne said, like, we really ought to put a glossary in this thing. I was like, we don't need to. I mean, that's the fun of comics is when I was reading Dr. Doom's speeches and he says, you, you, uh, you, you, you know, poltroon or something. I'd be like, what is that? And I'd look it up. You know, mm-hmm. so but she said people aren't going to be able to look up these terms. Let's put it in the book. Um, that's right. But yes, uh, th- th- actually, that's in my Etsy store. There's still some copies left, but that's, uh, we did a limited run. So okay. Uh, if th- well, I, looking forward to what else Captain Lau gets into. Yeah, this just for backstory of everybody. This was. Um, it was my cat's 15th birthday. <laughs> and and, 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 and Ann and I were talking about, like, what are we going to do for his birthday? What are we going to do? He's 15. You know, he, we didn't think he was going to make it this far. And so I said, well, let's do a comic about him. And I thought we were going to do, like, the story of how I found him, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and instead, Ann's like, no, no, let's do something fictional. And one of her favorite movies is The, uh, the Ghost and Mrs. Muir, which is a Rex Harrison film about mm-hmm. a ghost of a sailor. She's like, what if we did Lau as Rex Harrison? Uh, so, yeah. Actually, that's the- now that you mentioned that, he does look like Rex Harrison. We, we, we totally ripped <laughs> out the outfit. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah. So. I did not know that little tidbit. So, yeah. Anyway, so, yeah, it's just the comic of my cats, if you like that kind of thing. <laughs> Another salty sea yes. dog is a couple of kids' books, um, comic books, uh, Saltwater Taffy, The Seaside Adventures of Jack and Benny. And mm. I find that amusing, Jack Benny. But um, <laughs> <laughs> at any rate, Matthew La- Lou, I think is how you pronounce his name, is... Um, presents to you a really fun story that also I'm fascinated by his illustrations. The characters are totally cartoony. Mm -hmm. Um, Sometimes the hands are not even, you know. Rendered as individual fingers, They look like potatoes with lines across them sometimes. (laughs) But the the backdrop scenery out at the sea. Very lush backgrounds. Very lush. And so that works together to tell this kind of, you know, out of, you know, reality experience of this giant whale that's um, trying to attack and eat a giant baby squid and how Jack and Benny get tied up in the whole um, saga. And so yet another tale that will go down in the annals <laughs> of the Chowder Bay folklore. Oh, so, cool. Who, who put this out? Who published this? Um, Oni Press. Oni, yeah. Oh, they always do such interesting things. You know, this it just gives me kind of like a Tezuka feel, but with like an American vibe to it. You know, like Tezuka mm-hmm. does like those rich backgrounds and like cartoony mm-hmm. f- foreground characters. Yeah, yeah that really I, cool. that I kind of kind of found fun. Um, by Carol and Matt Dembiski, uh, Mr. Big, A Tale of Pond Life. And um, it's it's done in full color. It's very richly done. Um, about, you know, first you think it's going to be somewhat idyllic, except for on the cover, Mr. Big is a snapper turtle that his eye just kind of unsettles you. Yeah. Um, and it, it basically is kind of an environmental story, but the characters are fascinating, and it sets you up realizing that in a pond, it's not just daytime, uh, struggle for life and death and survival. It's nighttime as well. And how the snapper, Mr. Big, is kind of the lord of the, the entire land. Um, oh. the, s- the story begins to turn when um, some fish and, I don't know, frogs begin to become disgruntled with Mr. Uh, Big and decide, you know, 
he's really ruining, he's killing our children, you know, he's ruining pond life here. I think we need to take care of this problem. Uh -huh. So they go talk to a murder of crow <laughs> and decide that, you know, maybe they can take out Mr. Big. But what they don't realize and understand is that if they take out Mr. Big, there may be something else even worse. There's always a bigger fish. Waiting yeah. in the wings. So it's sort of it's sort of an environmental story, but it's pretty dramatic for a little kid's book. So it's um, it's like an epic version of Mr. Bear or yeah Mr. Bear squash you all flat right yeah <laughs> yeah like the 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 the, the nature Glen uh, bully and how the other animals conspire against it, it. exactly and it it it's compelling enough that you're kind of going well who is going to win this is this new Asian whatever he is fish that walks across land going to take out Mr. Big is Mr. Big going to take out the fish are the crows going to take them both out wow. you know what's going to happen very cool um, so yep that's fun. And then I just finished um, Sailor, Sailor Twain, Twain by, by Mark, Mark Siegel, Siegel, which is, is, I guess it was perfect for the days that I read it on. It was so gloomy. And this entire book in black and white. Here's is more of that soft pencil stuff we were talking about yeah, earlier. Yeah, It's just so wrapped in the fog and the gloom of the Hudson River and this captain who has rescued a mermaid that was a hanging on to the side of his boat, keeping her secret and becoming more and more intrigued by her. But who is she and, you know, what is happening to other strange uh, characters on board? Some can't leave the boat. The Lorelei, you know, all of this adds up to amazing mythology and stories, mystery, the whole bit. It's just, it's a lot of fun. And this is published through first second. Mm -hmm. Enough said. Mm -hmm. it, 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 everything they do is amazing. But yes, uh, nothing but great things I've been hearing about this book. I've, yeah. I've yet to read it, but it looks gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Mark Siegel uh, knocked it out of the park, it looks like. Yeah. So, so. that's my salty dog stuff. <laughs> okay, well, um, we've got an event coming up at the Ann Arbor District Library yes, we this do. Sunday. This Sunday, 1 to 3 p.m. We're going to be visited by this gal, so I brought her book to do a Yay. book talk on. Uh, Winters in Lavelle by Casey Van Heis, <laughs> uh, which is basically, uh, can you open it up? Because that's, yeah, sure. there we go. The cover's kind of shiny. Um, it's basically, uh, Casey herself has described the book as. Uh, Chronicles of Narnia, uh, but if if the but with with just two of the kids, but the, but it's it's so much more than that. Uh, it's and I say this with all love and respect to C.S. Lewis, but it's so much more than, than Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, if if you like fantasy and deer men and and dragon men and uh, and kids rising to the challenge of being dropped into an adventure, it's also really really funny. There's really fun characters. It's one of my favorite comics on the web. Mm -hmm. And Casey is going to be at the Ann Arbor District Library for the Comics Artist Forum, um, 1 to 3 p.m. 1 Sun to 3 p.m. Sunday this She's coming to us through Skype, and she's going to talk about uh, storytelling, um, manga, manga storytelling, That's which, right. of course, is what she does. So. Yeah, so her work yeah. is definitely influenced by manga. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, yeah. so that's a free event that we hold at the Ann Arbor District Library uh, first Sunday of every month where we have a guest speaker come in, and it's also just a chance to network and socialize with local cartoonists. And then I also wanted to throw this one on everybody's radar, talking about independent books, The Hero Code by Jamie Gamble and Jonathan Rector. Jonathan Rector is a guy who should be drawing every superhero comic in the world. He's, talk about energy. This guy, he has that shouty kind of energy like Jack Kirby we were talking about earlier. It's like when his character punches something, it's like, uh, oh, it just it's like it's it's from the astral plane it's like it's like a, an asgardian punch uh, the whole world falls apart uh when one of his characters punch something it's just the, the guy's amazing and uh you know I, I jamie better be paying him well to hang on to him because i think a lot of people are going to be coming for this guy uh eventually but uh, it's also just a great story jamie gamble's a great writer great guy and uh i w just thought we should point people at a superhero book that you can read that's not from the big two. So that's pretty different stuff, Winters and Lavelle and Heroes Code. It's not tied together like your stuff was, sure. Oh, well, that uh, was by accident. Hey, guys, uh, you guys, uh, Brandon or Rick or Paul, do you guys have any book recommendations that you would throw out at people that they should check out? Um, again, I was mentioning uh, Northlanders so far. It's been pretty good. I've just ordered some more of them. I've been going to a place called cheapgraphicnovels.com and just getting a whole bunch of other books, uh, you know, getting some extra issues of Razzle, which I just was surprised how much I liked it. Jeff Smith, yeah. Uh, R-A-S-L is the way that one's spelled. Mm -hmm. what, what, what was it that you liked so much about it, specifically? 
I just like just like the high concept idea of like traveling through dimensions, and it's like it wasn't what I was expecting it to be. I just had no idea what that story was about. So, but everyone kept talking about it. So, I got the first issue of it a couple of months ago, and I'm like, "Wow, oh, this is really good." So, I just ordered a whole bunch of them recently during uh, you know a Black Friday sale. Oh yeah, good move. Okay, so uh, Razzle and Northlanders, uh, which will be linked in the show notes. Uh, Eric Kloster diligently captures all of these names that we throw out during the show, so that people can. And of course, Habibi, if you can find it. Mm-hmm. Is that is that at your library, probably. Yeah, yeah, it's at our <laughs> library. Yeah, uh, the Ann Arbor District Library has a pretty impressive comics collection. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, but we don't have Watson and Holmes yet. Well, you, you had to get the print edition. I know. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, Brandon, <laughs> <laughs> we, we have the first issue as a noir edition that was for the uh, New York Comic Con. We still have some left. All right. But the, 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 the other trick with it is, is that most libraries want hard, uh, you know, uh, hard spined books. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So you get, wait for we, the we might have something available next year for that. Yeah. So we'll have you back on to talk about it then. Uh, Rick, what's what's one of the best things you've read? Uh, can you think of any really exceptional comics you've read recently? <laughs> Um, I'm actually pretty pretty ill read. If there's an opposite to well read, I'm ill read these days. Um, uh, when it comes to comic books, um, the one thing that I was again trying to re-educate myself about was was uh, knocking characters out in silhouette. So I went back and I dragged out all my old Milk Kniff reprints ah, from nice. Harry and um, from Steve Canyon, the kitchen sink stuff, particularly for Steve Canyon. So I think I think that stuff's still available, and it's well worth reading if you want to, like I say, brush up to the brush up with the, the the original guys, the guys who, the guys on whose shoulders we stand. <laughs> yeah, the Steve Canyon stuff is great. I haven't looked at that in a long time either. That's that's a good reminder to everybody: is go back and look at the masters every once in a while. Yeah, um, yeah. So Milton Kniff, uh, Paul. Anything that you've been reading that you really l- loved? Uh, yeah, actually, I've been going through and rereading the Goon collection. Mm-hmm. I've got all those Eric Howell's Goon, which I think is quite wonderful. The Goon. Yep, <laughs> it's really nice. So, okay, cool. So, the Goon by Eric Powell, Milton Kniss, uh, Steve Canyon, and then we had the Northlanders, Habibi, and. Uh, Razzle, uh, also unless mm-hmm. Also, I want to throw out one more. Um, also, if you go to cartoonarchy.com, uh, speaking of uh, public domain characters, uh, Kim Holm recently <laughs> completed his uh, Pickman's Model uh, story by, uh, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the author's name, uh, Squids. He <laughs> is, is, is the, the horror writer who always does like squids and, and disgusting imagery. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm going to get yelled at by so many people after this show. <laughs> He's a famous. Uh, Lovecraft, thank you, Matt. Matt Dubay <laughs> saves the day. Gosh, squids. How does that help anybody? Uh, <laughs> okay, but yes, that's at cartoonarchy.com if you want to check out uh, another great, you know, envisioning of uh, a public domain story. So, okay, uh, one last time, where can we find Watson and Holmes if we want to purchase it or preview it? Brandon? Brandon, can you hear me? Am I still in? I can hear you now. Okay. Yeah, you're breaking up a bit. Oh, <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, where, where can we find Watson and Holmes? Where's the best place to get it? Right now, Comics Plus. Yeah, Comics Plus, which is an Android or iOS app. And th- there's a web interface, too, yeah? You can get it right off of the new... And par- again, if you go through uh, newparadigmstudios.com, if you're interested in a print copy, we still have some. Send me... Uh, an email through the site. There's like a you know a, a question thing on the site, mm-hmm. and uh, right now we have a few shops in the area in New Jersey carrying the book. Uh, right now we have Clockwork Comics and Cards that carry a few issues of them right now. So um, if you consistently if you call them up, they might have some left. Okay. So um, and then where else can we find you? Are, are you on Twitter? So uh, your your NPS or NP Studios on Twitter, I know, but do you have a personal Twitter handle that people can follow? Uh, mine is, uh, I think it's uh, <laughs> B Perlo NPS for me. B Perlo NPS. What about you, Paul? You know what? I actually cannot remember what my Twitter is right now. <laughs> However, once uh, I start posting on New Paradigm some more, then I will uh, have okay. one up. Well, we do have a Facebook page with uh, New Paradigm Studios, and we have a uh, 
Watson and Holmes Facebook page where people can post too. And Rick, there's no way we can reach you virtually, right? No, this is it. <laughs> this is as close as you get, after kids. After I hang up, I'm gone. <laughs> Just a flash <laughs> that he's gone. Luddite. <laughs> <laughs> well, the offer still stands, Rick, if you want to come on to talk about fluidity and, uh, you know, gesture and acting through your characters and everything. I think that'd be a great topic for discussion in the future. Well, yeah. Well, now you know how to find me. I mean, I'm okay. perfectly happy to talk about this stuff. Great. So, Yarn away. Put them all to sleep. So great. two <laughs> issues, two issues are now available of Watson and Holmes, and uh, they look great on your iPad or Android tablet, and then uh, that's on Comics Plus, so uh, go check it out. Thank you guys so much for taking time. We did not get through a tenth of what I wanted to talk about today, but that's you know why we always have follow-up later on. Uh, but uh, so once again, thank you to the Ann Arbor District Library for putting the show on every two weeks at Comics. Uh, comics are great. Dot .tv is where we stream. This will be archived at comicsregate.com slash CAG68. Uh, we'll be back in two weeks with a guest, Raina Telgemeier. We're going to do an episode all about drama. The, 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 just talking about one book the whole time, uh, just drama. And we're going to have a special guest, uh, Skype guest, along with Raina, as, which will be a surprise. Uh, see you guys in two weeks, December 12th. Uh, so uh, thanks once again to Brandon Perlo and Paul Mendoza and Rick Leonardi. It was a pleasure talking to you guys. Thanks so much. Thank you, Sharon Iverson. Sure. And thanks, everybody, for downloading. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, thanks, everybody, for downloading and listening. Until next time, I've been Jersey Drozd of ComicsAreGreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. Okay, bye. Okay.